stuff, but we are in gear now. So we should start to see some participants. If you click the participant button, you can start to see attendees. Oh, look. There's Deborah Mandel. And I'm looking at who's piling in. Oh, Jeffrey Pearson is here, the fabulous Jeffrey Pearson. And who else? Kate McGivern. Lots of interesting people here. Lisa Hooper. Lisa Hooper. This is great. Who else is coming in today? This is fine. Everybody, welcome to the webinar. We're kind of letting every, everybody get uh, get in here before I start doing uh, introductions and announcements and stuff like that. So, but so far we have about 52 and the room is filling up with folks. This is fine. We have a good group today and I'm really excited about this webinar. Okay, there's Matthew Koppel. Hi, Matthew. Okay. From Cornell. We were talking earlier this week. And let's see, who else? Lisa Hooper says, hey, you guys. Can you see the chat windows, guys? Monique Farid, hi, Jeff. This is Mo, can you hear me? Yes, Mo, I cannot hear you, but I can definitely read your text. So if you wanna have something, you know, you wanna say, we're not, we're not uh, um, putting all the, all the attendees on. Uh, oh, and this, um, Mo, uh, you're you're gonna rerun this, are you not? You're gonna use this for the uh, international? Uh, Leslie from Third World Newsreel is happy to be here. St. Louis Public Library is here. Jeffrey Pearson. Monique three. Oh yes, yes. Monique is going to uh, replay this. Uh, because there's a lot of people interested in digitization at IFLA, IFLA. So, at the, uh, and where is that conference this year, Monique? Text me, where is it? Well, anyway. I'm only gonna wait another minute or so here and then I'm gonna get going, but Dublin, yeah. I'm sure there's a reason why I should be going. I'll have to appeal to the board. I'm sure there's a reason why I should be attending that conference in Dublin. I'm sure it's important for me to be there. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get let's get started here. It's very nice to have you all here at the first. This is the first webinar we've had that is officially branded as a Video Trust production, and we're glad you're all here. This is about digitizing in your library. We are uh, graced by three distinguished uh, panelists who all have a terrific uh, experience to share, very diverse uh, set of experiences about, about uh, digitization. And um, it's gonna be really interesting. Uh, we're, we're gonna be hosted by uh, Aaron uh, DeWitt Miller from uh, University of North, North Texas and uh, Charles Cobine. We're especially grateful to our sponsors today who are Third World Newsreel and Video Project. And you'll be seeing a couple of uh, short presentations by those two sponsors today. And we are, uh, thank you very much to both of you for, for being here and helping out with this and making this possible today. Um, we are recording this today and it will be, uh, you'll be able to access it from our website. The videotrust.org website has a, uh, uh, an archive of, of all of our past webinars. Um, there's, there's two from last fall and we'll be adding this one shortly. This, these recordings are usually available within 24 hours. Okay, uh, I wanted to mention that ALVT, our project, our ALVT project is sponsoring the Miami Copyright Conference this year. In case you hadn't seen it, we have a really interesting guest blog on our site right now about uh, Israeli libraries cons considering starting their own version of ALVT. That's, that's worth a read. And um, we have an April webinar coming up about teaching with film. And we'll be announcing the dates and all the participants and so forth very shortly. 
So keep watching your newsletter for that. I want to uh, go ahead and introduce the delightful Rosalie Torres, who's here from Third World Newsreel. And she's, let me just give you a little information about Third World Newsreel in case you don't already know. Third World Newsreel is a media arts organization that fosters the creation, appreciation, and dissemination of independent social justice, uh, social justice films made by and about people of color. The organization distributes more than 700 films to the educational market in the US and Canada, including the Newsreel collection of radical media made in the late 60s and early 70s covering the anti-Vietnam War movement, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, the Women's Liberation Movement, and more. So very interesting. Rosalie, I'm gonna hand this over to you. You can unmute and, and, and share your reel, however you'd like to proceed, thank you. Ready? Yes, ready. Hi, Jeff, thank you so much. And hi to everyone at the National Media Market. Uh, thank you for welcoming Third World Newsreel. This today we're going to show you a clip of our 2018-2019 film releases. It's like around five minutes long, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Let me share the screen now. Is it working? No. We decided, you know, individually, we, we just weren't going to sign it because they call us an enemy alien. We're not an enemy alien, we're an American citizen. And they said, we'll fine you $10,000 and 20 years in prison. And that didn't even scare us. Can the opera genre be deconstructed so that we may bring opera back to the plebeian statue? And could immigration be one of the popular stories that we can sing about? C'est-à-dire qu'on voit l'immigration des Africains ou des pauvres, mais on ne voit pas l'immigration des Européens eux-mêmes. You know, as Boricuas planted themselves in New York, planted themselves in the asphalt, the game for them started to really elevate and that create creativity that had been the spine of what defines outdoor basketball started to position into the New York ball players. The nail industry is a seven and a half billion dollar industry that focuses just on nails. And more than half of these salons are Vietnamese. If you're a Vietnamese American, within two degrees of separation, you have somebody working in the nail industry, if not one degree, your auntie, your uncle, your relative, your cousin. <laughs> There's somebody you know. I'm half Vietnamese, and even I have family in the business. Enorma, una de las integrantes del grupo de las patronas, un grupo de mujeres que durante más de 20 años llevan ayudando con lo poco que tienen a los inmigrantes que cruzan México para llegar a Estados Unidos. Pues sí, nosotros, yo creo que, que para, para ayudar no necesitamos tener riquezas, ¿no? simplemente tenemos que tener el, el, el deseo de ayudar. It's a really lonely feeling. It's a really lonely way of, of growing up because it's not something you talk about. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those walls of, of your community or, or the family where you don't say it. And it, when you are a foster kid, it's something you don't want to admit to. You don't want to admit that you don't have a permanent home, that you don't have a permanent place to be. There are plenty of people out there just growing up with their mothers and their fathers are just out. It's not uncommon. It's sad to say, kind of like normal, you know? As a documentary filmmaker, I decided I would go out and ask men who were raised by single mothers, what was life like for them? Maybe this would help me. Maybe it would help me help my son. I spent a lot of time trying to get this. Irrefutable acceptance of my blackness. But other people challenge me, not because of my ancestry, because I break too many rules. 
And it's not just me looking for acceptance. My family, too. Uh, I think now maybe I feel more comfortable with white people, but, uh, and, I, and I have guilt about that. I feel bad about it. Hi, Mom. For a long time, I guess I couldn't even fathom telling you about my partner or my queerness. You were at first of the disposition that being LGBT is a lifestyle choice and a face, but you quickly figured out it's not going away. And more importantly, that I'm still that silly, goofy child of yours. So, you know, at that point, when the gunshot, you know, it extra load inside the house. So everybody started crying. The table, the dining table it was a small, it's a small dining table and all 13 people is trying to fit underneath there because everybody was scared. Awesome. Thank you very much. Great reel. Very captivating. Okay. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn this over to Aaron. We have Aaron uh, uh, here and, and also Charles Cobine, and, and they're going to be doing most of the hosting today. So I'm going to sit back and listen. But uh, Thank you very much. Erin, take over, please. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Jeff. So we're going to be talking about digitizing video today, um, specifically VHS for preservation, um, for in mainly for inclusion in the academic libraries video trust. Um, our panelists include Bill Salvador from American University, Tom Nemeth from William Patterson, and David Rodriguez from Florida State University. Um, each of these guys has unique experience doing this work, and so they have insight to share about what they do and how they're doing it. Um, after the initial three presentations, then we're going to have another um, Market Mania segment from Video Project, and then we're going to do some Q&A at the end. So um, first up is Bill Salvador, who's the Visual Media Collections Coordina Coordinator at the American University Library. Among his media collection management responsibilities, he handles the library's VHS preservation project, which he assumed responsibility for in 2016. So Bill, I think we'll turn it over to you. All right. Hello. Let me fire up PowerPoint here. All right, hello. Uh, so I wanna talk about the VHS digitization project we've been doing at the American University Library and some of the choices we made uh, about our workflow and how we're gonna do it. Uh, so we're, we've been doing a project for a while to try to digitize all of the out of distribution VHS tapes in our circulating VHS collection. Um, I guess what, what makes it unusual at the American University Library is that, oop, can I, is it not, there we go. Um, so none of our staff are trained archivists. So we're doing this kind of within the responsibilities we already have for collection development at the American University Library. Uh, I'm the collection coordinator. We're also working with our media librarian, Chris Lewis. And we don't really, we didn't really have a background in doing digitization or archival work going into this. Uh, but the more we've thought about it, you know, it was the things we wanted to digitize were fairly low use and were like a low priority for, um, you know, other universities doing this work, and we figured if no one was going to do it now, like, we'd have to be the people to do it. So we just wanted to do something. And so we made the deliberate choice that we didn't want this to be, you know, we, if we couldn't do it perfectly, we wanted to do it good enough. We wanted to do an okay enough job for access quality. Uh, so we started working on a workflow. We talked with uh, digital preservation professionals, got their opinion on different software and such. And we started a workflow that was going to be uh, relatively easy for us to do, that was going to fit within our budget, and that would fit into our existing job responsibilities. So it started out pretty low end. Uh, we started out using just kind of whatever equipment we happened to have, um, just getting you know small amounts of budget to get some additional software or capture devices. And over time, as we've gotten you know more comfortable with it, as we've gotten more situated uh, with doing this project in our institution, we've sort of we've been able to improve that workflow over time. So we've been able to adapt and change, but we did start out really kind of on the low end of things with relatively cheap equipment. When we first started talking to other universities about doing this, um, one thing we kept hearing was that we had to do it at archival quality. We would have to get like, you know, large uncompressed video files. 
we made the deliberate choice not to do that at the start of the project. Uh, part of it was really a quality thing because we're using uh, VHSs that have been circulating for decades and they're uh, a little more worn down. They're not really new VHSs anymore, so it's not a huge quality difference. But it was also just a strategic choice that you know we decided to capture things at a compressed quality and save it at a compressed quality just because we could do more with the limited storage space we have. You know, we have a big hard drive array right over here. You can't see because there's no camera, but right over here I have a big array of hard drives that we sort of eventually got. But before that, we were just kind of operating with what space we had. And you can fit, you know, if you compress it down, you can fit much more video than you can doing it uncompressed. So that was just one of those choices we made to kind of work around what limitations we have in terms of resources and budget. Uh, normally I would talk about like what specific equipment and software we're using, but instead I want to point you towards an amazing resource. Uh, this is by Ashley Bluer uh, called the Minimum Viable Workstation Document. And I think, uh, I think Jeff was going to post the link to this somewhere later, but uh, this is a collaborative Google Doc where uh, video archivists have sourced different tiers of what kind of software and hard hardware you can use for a digitization project. So it's everything from like, you know, a $15,000 expensive digitization workstation in a server rack all the way down to like the cheapest thing you can get on Amazon sitting in a pile on the floor. And you can kind of, you can choose, you know, what level you want to work with. You can start with the Amazon pile and you can slowly work your way up as you get a larger budget, as it becomes a bigger part of your university. This is such a useful document. So if you're considering doing this and you're strapped for resources, labor, et cetera, this is a really great way to see like what the minimum is and what the next step above that is so you can continue growing. So huge thanks to Ashley and her folks for putting this together. It's a really great document. So in terms of what we've learned from doing all this, um, there have been a couple things. So one of the big things is that uh, we are doing this relatively independently in our institution. We're kind of doing this on our own, forging ahead, you know, using our own equipment, which has meant that we've been responsible for troubleshooting our own problems, which can be difficult. Uh, it can kind of be a little lonely sometimes, honestly. Um, but, you know, we've come to, you know, understand the troubleshooting process better. We've come to rely on other folks who work at other institutions, like some folks in the uh, video trust for helping with some of those problems too. Uh, another big part is that just over time, the time commitment has continued to scale up for this project as we've been ramping it up. Um, you know, when we started this, I think it was supposed to be about a third of my job responsibilities, and now I think it's closer to half or two thirds working with this project, especially as we've been participating in the Academic Libraries Video Trust, which has been hugely beneficial, but it has also been a larger time commitment. So it's just kind of been balancing the responsibilities and time we have to dedicate to this project with how my own responsibilities and the rest of my job have shifted around over time. And the other big thing is um, thinking about the acceptable quality. Uh, for what we're doing. So I mentioned that we started out using lower end equipment, lower end capture software. Uh, looking back on some of the stuff we did five years ago, it's not great quality. And like, there's something in the back of my mind just thinking like, we should redo this, we should go back. But you know, we, we made the decision at the start of the project to say that we wanted acceptable, good enough quality for a lot of this. And you know, part of it is as we've been able to do better than just good, it's kind of been looking back and saying, you know, it's fine what we've done before. We set a standard for ourselves that we're still meeting, we're exceeding it now, but just kind of getting in that headspace of because we can do much better now as we've scaled up, still being able to accept you know, what we had done when we were a little more strapped on resources. But I guess the major takeaway is that this is something that your library can do. Uh, you know, since we started doing this project, we've digitized over 2,000 VHS tapes using our existing staff, using uh, relatively small resources considering the scale of the project. And if, if this is something your library can do, you can start small, you can scale it up. If you're just doing a small station for a couple tapes or you're trying to do, you know, your whole uh, 2,000 tape circulating collection, there's different levels you can start at and you can incorporate it into what, whatever, you know, equipment and labor your library already has. Uh, that kind of sums it up. So that's what we've been doing, kind of uh, adapting as we go based on available resources. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Phil. And just to remind everybody, we're going to have time at the end for um, questions. So next up is Tom Nemeth, um, who is a digital collections manager at William Patterson University. Uh, he works in the video production unit of the university's IT department. 
performing digital asset management and enabling streaming of the university's educational video assets in close collaboration with the library. Thank you, Erin. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about how we digitize here at William Patterson University, which involves a collaboration between our library and media technicians in the IT department where I'm located, as opposed to the entire operation occurring solely within our library. So within that multi-departmental context, I'm going to lead with the schematic representation of our workflow process. Circa 2015, our institution had about 700 to 800 VHS tapes in our circulating collection that we decided we wanted to deaccession and replace with online streaming copies where possible. The reason for this is that we already had amassed a sizable collection of educational streaming videos by that point. So it made sense to convert our remaining analog tapes to digital. Plus, of course, VHS was becoming increasingly obsolete. My colleague at the time, Jane Hutchison, seen here, researched the commercial availability of these tapes and identified roughly 300 of them that she felt we could legally reformat to digital. So we assembled a team and began working. To make the remaining steps of the workflow easy to follow, I'm just going to choose one of these tapes earmarked for digitization, Holy Ghost People, seen here, and use it as an example to walk you through the remaining steps of the workflow. Here's just a look at the tape itself. So at this point, Jane would email the call number of our VHS copy of Holy Ghost People to our media technician in the library, Scott Nelson, seen here. Scott would play the tape with the bottom tape deck in the alignment seen here and feed the signal through a time-based corrector to stabilize the signal and then pass it along to the top tape deck recording to DVD-R. In, in the next step, Scott uses DVD labeling software to design a label for the DVD-R and a printer to affix the label to the DVD. The printer is the top device with the stack of DVDs in this photo. And here's a look at the end result for Holy Ghost People. Now I want to point out that this DVD primarily serves as a means for us to get from VHS to streaming. So at this point, Scott would email me to let me know he has the DVD for Holy Ghost People. And I would pick it up from him and bring it back with me to my workstation on the other side of campus. Back at my office, I use a computer application called MPEG Stream Clip to rip and rewrap the DVD and save the resulting file temporarily to our local network storage. MPEG Stream Clip is free software that you can download from the web at squared5.com, but you can use any encoding software you'd like at this step. I'm just pointing out the MPEG Stream Clip because it's what we use and it's free. Now getting back to Holy Ghost People, I transcode it with the H.264 codec, just as um, Phil showed. Because it's ubiquitous and we know our faculty and students can stream it on campus and off campus without issue. Here's a look at the resultant digital file as it resides on our local network storage. And here's a screenshot of Holy Ghost People playing with the QuickTime player. Now that's the crux of our digitization effort itself, but to quickly complete the overview of our entire workflow, the next step is twofold. One, we upload, I upload the file to ALVT, and two, I ingest it into our Fedora-based archive, which has a custom-built streaming platform laid on top of it. And it's through this streaming flat platform that we would actually stream Holy Ghost People to our faculty and students. Uploading the file online creates a web link to watch the film. And I email this link to our media cataloger, which started as Mark, and then it became David, and now it's Imani. The media cataloger updates the Mark record for Holy Ghost People with the streaming link that I provide. Once all this is complete, we deaccession the VHS tape, meaning it goes downstairs into compact shelving in our library's basement. And the Holy Ghost People DVD goes into our circulating DVD collection for any patron who wants to borrow the DVD rather than access the streaming copy. Both are available to patrons. And this is a photo of our collection of DVD-Rs that have resulted from this project. Now I'm going to provide some advice based on lessons learned. Number one, don't be intimidated because you don't have to be technical wizards to perform the steps that I just showed you. Number two, don't wait um, because the longer you wait, the more unstable your tapes will get and any equipment you need to buy such as tape decks will just get more expensive to purchase as time goes on. Plus it is going to get more difficult over time to find repair people and component parts with which to repair the equipment um, you're using should it break down. Number three, get institutional support. If you're the sole person digitizing at your institution, I suppose you can take matters into your own hands and do what you want when you want. 
but with a large scale, multi-step, multi-department workflow like the one I just showed you, you need institutional support throughout the organizational hierarchy so that all team members will remain on the same page without conflicting priorities getting in the way and impeding progress. Um, so it really helps to have an esprit de corps when it comes to this um, uh, workflow. And number four, have one person shepherd the project along and take ownership. This will prevent communication breakdowns through each step of the process and prevent work product and action items from getting lost in the shuffle. Plus, ideally, this person will be empowered to see the project through to completion, which can take months and even years in our case. So that's the process in a nutshell here at William Patterson, and I'd like to turn the presentation back over to Aaron. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you, um, Tom. Uh, so next up, we're going to hear from Dave Rodriguez, who currently serves as resident media librarian in the Office of Digital Research and Scholarship at Florida State University Libraries. He has experience in film and audiovisual preservation, um, about a decade of experience across libraries, museums, um, post-production facilities, and in nonprofit. His work at FSU focuses on building media preservation infrastructure and bridging, bridging it with initiatives in digital scholarship, digital repository management, and other library services. Um, so take it away, Dave. Hey, everybody. Um, let me share my screen here. OK, can everybody see my uh, animated GIF here? Okay, um, so um, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, today, um, I'm gonna talk very quickly um, about our VHS digitization setup that we have here uh, at the library um, uh, at FSU, the workflow we use and uh, share some further information about um, the resources for those who are uh, interested in sort of setting up a similar system at their institution. Uh, there's a lot of links and there's a lot of info and a lot of jargon uh, in this quick uh, slide deck. So feel free to use this bit.ly link uh, to revisit all this later, especially in terms of getting access um, to the various uh, links and such. Uh, so down to business. So here is um, sort of a simplified signal path uh, diagram of the VHS digitization setup that we've built here at FSU Library. Um, this is what I would call a light weight, good quality um, uh, setup uh, that really works well for um, meeting the demands of ALBT and can even do some sort of like higher grade um, archival preservation, capital A, capital P uh, level of work. Um, we use um, an SVHS deck, uh, the Panasonic uh, AG 1980. Uh, we were fortunate to have a few of these laying around the library in good working order that I was able to kind of refurbish. Uh, we capture everything through S uh, video. We run left right audio through a little like Mackie mixer. And then we capture everything um, through a Blackmagic intense, intense city shuttle uh, set up to a MacBook Pro, uh, which is running an open source software called V Record, which we'll talk more about in a second. Um, and as you can see uh, from looking at the specs, this MacBook Pro isn't uh, particularly new and it isn't particularly like supercharged. Um, so, uh, but it, you know, kind of gets the job done for what we need. So you don't need like super new kind of technology to engage in this kind of work. Um, and then we also augment uh, the internal storage uh, of that uh, computer with um, an external four terabyte hard drive. Um, here's a breakdown of all the approximate costs of all the equipment in our core like workflow. This isn't what we paid per se, but if we wanted to sort of create an identical sort of setup, this is about how much it would cost. Um, upon joining ALVT, um, the only thing that we had to purchase on our end was uh, the intensity shuttle, the Thunderbolt cable, and um, the external hard drive. Everything else we were able to sort of internally source from um, library systems and um, campus surplus and stuff. Um, as has already been talked about uh, in a couple of the other presentations, one piece of equipment that is not included in this work included in this workflow is something called a time-based corrector. And very quickly, uh, TBC is an electrical process that corrects instabilities that are found in any analog signal um, that is usually necessary to get a clean quality uh, digital capture of something. And the reason why our workflow doesn't contain it is because the SVHS decks that we use actually have TBC already built into them. And this is a feature of sort of higher quality uh, commercial based decks that your 
um, that like, you know, um, most VCRs don't have, you know, the one that's sitting in your living room right now likely uh, doesn't have TBC like built in. So depending on the playback um, hardware you're using and the capture hardware that you're using, you may or may not need to consider this important piece of equipment in your like workflow. Um, so just kind of FYI there. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we use an open source uh, free and an open source software called vRecord uh, to handle all of the capture. This um, software is maintained by the really great people at the Association of, of the Association of Moving Image Archivists Open Source Committee. Uh, this got released a couple of years ago and has really been a huge boon uh, to the field, really sort of enabling people to do this kind of work where they may not have been able to do it before. Um, it does have a bit of a learning curve is that you have to have kind of like elementary knowledge of how to use the command line in order to install, configure, and um, run the software. Um, so just kind of FYI, uh, going in there um, and but you know like once you do have it up and running it's really fantastic it's pretty intuitive um, and if you're interested in sort of seeing it in action um, I would definitely recommend taking a look at this uh, presentation from the 2018 um, AMIA conference. Uh, so as far as technical specs go for capture so we do capture everything on compressed uh, 10 bit um, sort of this very high quality standard in order to get the best sort of um, the like highest quality capture that we can get at that first ingest. And then we um, have similar sort of high quality specs for the audio as well. And then after capture, I do batch processing on everything to create these, to create sort of like nice high quality, but um, much sort of lighter weight H.264 AAC or, um, derivatives using um, this FFmpeg script. Um, and then these um, access files that are created uh, are the things that actually get uploaded uh, to ALVT. And for those of you who don't know, um, FFmpeg is an open source framework uh, for handling audio, um, you know, pretty much any kind of AV content. Um, and it's uh, super sort of compatible and can kind of read and edit and transcode pretty much anything you're likely to come across. Um, so, you know, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be around for the Q&A as well as the, the rest of us. Um, take a look at these resources uh, for more info on digitization technology, uh, where to actually find some of this stuff, and then like um, supplementary skills for like working at the command line and using um, FFmpeg and all that. So uh, thank you. All right, I'm all done, I think. Yeah, I got it. I'm sorry. I was just okay. getting a little behind there. I was having trouble, having trouble moving my, uh, <laughs> actually moving my fingers to the right place. So I just wanted to take a moment. Or we're going to do Q&A in just a minute. So get your questions ready. And you can put those in the chat window. Or you can also, there's a QA and a window. And if you uh, move your uh, mouse over the screen, you should be able to find that. I'm going to introduce Arlen Golden from the Video Project, uh, who's one of our sponsors today, and he's going to uh, play a reel for us. Video Project has been honored to provide some of the best documentary films to schools and libraries for nearly 40 years. In 2019, they returned to their roots and reconfigured as a nonprofit under the guidance of the co directors Michael Kunert and Arlen Golden. Historically, Video Project was best known for anti nuclear and environmental films, but in the last several years, has expanded its documentary offerings to include a wide range of contemporary and pressing issues, including social justice, labor, education, and ethnic studies, among many others. They've just released an exciting new slate of films for the spring and are thrilled to bring the latest film festival experience to the classroom, ladies and gentlemen, Arlen Golden. Uh, wow, thanks, Jeff, uh, for that intro. <laughs> Um, and I and, uh, want to just say on a personal note, i um, really excited to be here for this webinar just as somebody who uh, does VHS to digital as a hobby. Um, I think this is really important work. Uh, There's so many films that never got upgraded uh, or distributed on DVD uh, or are even on streaming. So um, I'm, I'm just grateful that, that there are professionals out there doing this work and, and sharing uh, their workflows is illuminating for me. 
Um, but um, yeah, Jeff, you know, pretty much said it all. We're, we're the same company we've always been, but we're a new company. Uh, we're a nonprofit. Um, and we're really proud of, of our recent releases, which I'm about to show you some clips from. Um, I will be following up with an email to all of you about this, but um, also apropos of the subject of today's webinar, um, we're going to be offering a discount code to all attendees today. That's going to be Video Trust 20. Um, that will uh, get you your digital site license with a DVD for no extra charge. So just the cost of the DVD uh, will include the digital site license uh, without the standard upgrade that, that I'm sure you all are used to paying. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and start this video and hope you enjoy. This video went This video went viral, but incidents like this can be found Does through that, Does that work? It's Oh god. Sorry. Did that work? Can I get a thumbs up, Jeff? Was that working? There was a stutter, but I think it was working, yeah. so go ahead. All right. It it told me something about resuming it. This video went viral, but incidents like this can be found throughout America. The criminalization of black girls in schools disrupts one of the most important factors in their lives, education. I would like for schools to become locations for healing so that they can become locations for learning. If you can get people to work for free, why wouldn't you? If you want any sort of career, you just stay quiet until you get hired because if you rock the boat at all, you're done. It's not copy and photocopying machines. They do real work and it, it looks good on their CV. <laughs> Uber is taking advantage of the decline in the condition of working people. $10 an hour. That's below minimum wage in San Francisco. Uber just see you as a tool to make money. We're like Uber honeybees making money for the queen. This sharing economy is owned by the 1%. We're actually in an era of digital feudalism. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump hit the trail hard. I'm a businessman and I look out for the interests of you. Do you want this as USA, your next president? USA, USA! The election simulation in Townsend Harris is a school-wide simulation mirroring whatever election process is going on right now in the country. We make sure that all of the elements like money are there. The Hillary Clinton campaign is having a big sale outside. There are Facebook pages, weekly TV shows. Two, one. Live radio shows. Things like America is very divided in their support for the next president. Make America great again. I voted for Jill Stein. She thought that Gary Johnson was hot. That's why she <laughs> voted for him. Did you meet Hillary Clinton? Nah, I didn't meet. Nah. It's in the video that we had. Werner has said, if you want to know madness, true madness, just look into the eye of a chicken. Here we see it magnified 100 fold. All men dream, but not equally. I believe that my God has put me on this earth to rid the world of that evil. It's a youth organization. It's not a Marine Corps recruiting program, and we're not trying to teach eight-year-old little boys or little girls 
why they should become Marines. Uh, my brothers, they came home crying from the Marines. I see myself as an American. I see myself as a Muslim. I see myself as a proud Yemeni American now more than ever, an unapologetically American Muslim. Being born in Indonesia, I almost never met any non-Muslims in my life. And I think that is one of the most important points of uh, being uh, me here in America. It changed me as a Muslim. So, what are you going to be doing when you're 25? Trying to stay alive. Being poor in England makes you more likely to fail than most developed countries. White working class children are falling far behind pupils who are wealthier or come from different ethnic groups. My dad, he can't read or write either. My dad's had it and I've had it now. My son's going to have it. Do you want to tell the camera what's your name? If you have. Great. Spit. Working out. This has been a huge realization for us, and of course Emma has been very patiently waiting for us to figure this out. <laughs> All right, thank you, Arlen, for uh, your reel there. And uh, thank you to uh, the video project and to uh, Third, uh, Third World News Reel. Um, and I think we can now open up the Q&A and take some questions from panelists um, that may have sent them in via chat. I saw, I have seen that there were a few questions earlier on as uh, during or during the presentations and I think we can probably just start there. Um, uh, and um, if we run out of questions, I also have some myself that I could contribute. Um, <clears throat> the first one I see here in our chat log um, was uh, during, I believe it was during the uh, uh, the first uh, presentation um, that Phil had done, and um, and um, Mark Boucher says, "Are you allowed to circulate the materials?" And by those, I think it means that he's he's referring to the VHS tapes. Do, are you allowed to circulate them, or do you need to seek permission, or are those uh, tools just backup in case the VHS gets damaged? Um, uh, Phil or Tom or Dave, would you care to respond to that? Yeah, uh, I actually have a visual aid I can bring up here really quick. Oh, great. Uh, if I can get Zoom to cooperate. All right. So uh, the mechanism that we are doing our VHS preservation under is uh, Section 108 of U.S. Copyright Law. Uh, specifically, there is a subsection, Section C here, that says that libraries have the right to create up to three copies of a published work uh, if it, the format is damaged, deteriorating, lost, stolen, or obsolete. Um, so there's some discussion about whether VHS counts as obsolete. We've determined that it is and that VHSs are also all technically deteriorating right now. But essentially, yes, we can, as long as, as, long as we've determined that there is no new copy of this on the marketplace right now, we can make a digitized copy and then circulate that in the collection under Section 108C. Um, so in terms of this part here where it says uh, coming up with an unused replacement can't be obtained at a fair price. Uh, what we've been doing is whenever we want to digitize something, we uh, do a search on, we look for the distributor, we look for it on Amazon, other major video marketplaces, and just try to come up with the paper trail to say that it's not available anywhere in a new format right now. We make a physical log of it so we can just always refer back to that and say like in 2017, we checked this and made sure. Uh, and this is actually something that the Academic Libraries Video Trust is doing now too. Um, so we have here, this is, I love this example video, this is internet, this amazingly dated video <laughs> about how the internet works. Um, but we've 
through the academic library video trust we've started putting up our own searches here too so for this one it was from the ala video network distributed by serious solutions we looked to see if the distributor had it on sale they did not it was not available on amazon or any other obvious e-commerce marketplace so we just put this this up here and said that we've done our due diligence we've checked it's not available commercially so under section 108 uh, we are allowed to make up to three digital copies and circulate them. Um, I imagine that uh, Tom is probably doing something similar with the DVD circulation. Um, and I imagine Dave also matches up with what you're doing too. Yeah, it looks familiar to me, I will say, from our perspective at Penn. And, uh, you know, I've been through this process as we're also a member institution of ALVT. Um, Dave or, or Tom, do you have anything to add on this? Um, yeah, sure. The only other tricky thing about um, section 108, which is, you know, um, a fantastic sort of section of the law, which we all hope, uh, or all of us hope uh, stays the way that it is. Uh, but one limitation that it does impose on libraries who are creating these copies is that they have to um, be contained to the premises of the library. So like traditionally, like you couldn't create a new DVD-R of a VHS tape and then like send that out um, via like, uh, um, interlibrary loan or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, now, in 2012, the ACRL did release um, a report on fair use in libraries that basically makes a pretty compelling fair use argument that says that, you know, over like secure digital sort of like networks kind of similar um, to, uh, to what uh, Tom is doing. Um, making this preserved content accessible to authorized patrons uh, would count as a fair use. So you're not relying on section 108 for your legal standing there. You're actually relying on fair use, which is a completely other section of the law. So um, it's a tricky thing to try to do um, for, from both a sort of technical sense, but um, you know, um, Tom, I'd love to talk to you more about how you do that with Fedora. Um, but um, you know, uh, it's, 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 you have to kind of look at a few different parts of copyright law to really get a sense of all of the options and all of the things that you can do once you make a, uh, a, um, a uh, preservation copy of something. Okay, uh, um, three quick points. Um, to concur with what Dave wrote in the chat room, uh, VHS is obsolete. I mean, the, like, like Dave said, they no longer produce VCRs and they no longer manufacture VHS tapes, so. I mean, it's, yeah, you have to consider it obsolete. So if you can't buy new stock anymore. Um, number two, we are adhering to, here at William Patterson, what I showed you is adhering to, um, well, that is what I showed you was the workflow for our Section 108 project. And at the beginning of my presentation, I, I breezed through the part where my colleague Jane researched the titles that we, identified as being um, legally permitted legally permitted to um, to reformat to, dig to digital and um, so that's a uh, was a short way of me saying that we were researching those titles that you know that uh, adhere to um, what we felt pa passed muster with with section 108 so, um, so yeah so so that's Great. the second point. And the third point, um, we're storing our VHS tapes in our basement to, you know, to, again, to piggyback on what, what Dave said, we're, store, we're, we're keeping our VHS tapes even though we're digitizing them. So, so, um, so yeah, so um, those three points. Okay, another follow-up question that uh, came up in the chat is another kind of uh, question about uh, copyright. And um, ha during the process of digitization, how often do you run into uh, sorts of uh, copyright protection um, on the tapes? And, and uh, do you feel that it's right to um, circumvent those? So the, the circumvention of DRM, which would like ostensibly be a violation of the digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, I've, from a technical standpoint, I haven't run into any problems with that with VHS. Um, but, um, you know, um, the legal arguments I've heard for circumventing any kind of DRM, this is something that um, the legal scholar Kevin Smith, who's now also the dean at um, Kansas University, has sort of um, forwarded that. Uh, he says, like, if you're if the reason you're circumventing DRM is for a legal sort of purpose, like creating a section 108 compliant copy, um, then that is fine. And if you look at the language of the 
of, of the, like, the MCA. It's down in like section G or I or something like that. I don't have it in front of me. But um, essentially the, the MCA has a clause that says like, you know, um, nothing in the DMCA um, can impinge on any other rights of the law. So like the right to free speech, the right to, you know, um, um, you know, to use something fairly. Uh, so I would say that, you know, if you're circumventing DRM and copyright and or and copy protection um, for the purposes of making a preservation copy that is compliant with the terms of section um, 108, then, you know, you're, you're, you're not breaking the law. Um, Technically, um, I, I, I can't speak to that because honestly, with like VHS, I've never run into that issue. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, I um, noticed that there are also some questions about like documentation. And this was one of the things that I had on my mind, if we could just kind of uh, uh, shift focus here to, um, you know, some of the uh, logistics of uh, digitization projects. Uh, have you all kind of put together uh, documentation of, uh, you know, how you do this um, for the future in case other coworkers would, would assume some of these responsibilities or, um, you know, is that, is that something that um, you maintain? I know that um, Beth Marahanka is asking whether uh, they'd be willing, you'd be willing to share any of your internal documentation for those of us who might be at the outset of a digitization project like this. Um, if I can go. Uh, so, what I mentioned earlier that we've been kind of iterating our process over the years, so AU started doing VHS digitization back in 2010, so I am the third person to be in this position doing this project. Uh, it's kind of been passed on from people who have been in the visual media collections coordinator position here. Um, so yeah, we have documentation and we've been kind of building on that as each new person comes through and continues to expand the process. Um, I wish I could share it out, I'm slightly behind on updating it for myself. Um, but that's been really important. I think having that chain of continuity is, is really important within, uh, especially like an academic library setting where people may be shifting around positions a bit, just to be able to, again, since we don't, we aren't like trained archival staff that a lot of people com coming into this position don't have, you know, a background in knowing how to do digitization stuff that is super useful for staff. Yeah. I also have, um, I have a search workflow document and a, um, a spreadsheet, uh, template that I use to sort of um, keep track of all of the searching that I'm doing and the um, student employees that I've worked with um, are probably doing and um, I'd be happy to share that with whoever needs it just uh, send me an email and I'd be happy to send it to you because um, yeah it is uh, it's helpful to have a sort of roadmap to kind of follow when you're determining whether or not something is section 108 compliant and a template to make sure that you're sort of uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, keeping track of all of those decisions should you have to, you know, um, justify why you made a section 108 copy of something. Yeah, one of the questions that I had, um, at, especially, I, I think I'm going to direct this question toward Tom now. Um, he met, you mentioned uh, at some point, you know, like one of your, one of your uh, recommendations was to all the other librarians out there, don't wait with your projects on this, you know, move ahead. We need to start thinking about digitization now. Um, and um, so um, that leads me to ask the question then, um, have you come across any uh, material that you found surprisingly, unfortunately, was was deteriorating or unstable? And, and what are some of the things that, that you or some of our other colleagues here have done when that's the case? Uh, not that I know of. Um, that, that was, um, you know, that part of the process was done by my colleagues. Um, I only come into the, the workflow midway through. Um, but as far as I'm aware, not, I mean, we did have um, some films that um, were beyond salvage. So, so um, in that case, I mean, there's there's nothing you can do, unfortunately. I mean, uh, so I don't have a, a, a fancy answer to that. But if it's unsalvageable, then it and it's then it's unsalvageable. Um, 
So, so that's what the AOVT is here for is for like one of the, uh, one of the uh, uses that, you know, if you've got a copy that you can no longer use because it's in your collection and it's deteriorated, hopefully somebody else has uploaded a copy of it and you can get it from them, so. Yeah, very true. <laughs> Phil, Dave, do you have anything else to uh, add to that? I think that's that's kind of it. Yeah, um, I have run across it. <laughs> Occasionally, we will try to borrow a tape from another university as a substitute. Um, I'm not sure if we're supposed to do that, um, but I've there have come across cases where a we got a tape that almost destroyed one of our VHS players. We got a copy from another university that almost destroyed another one of our VHS players. I don't know what happened with this particular tape. It was kind of a nightmare. Um, but yeah, that's why the Academic Library of Video Trust is exciting for us, because if someone else has done the work, that potentially could help us in this case. Yeah, those uh, VHS players are, are definitely like um, valued, valued items these days. Um, and, you know, now that the format is obsolete, you know, it's uh, hard to track one down or get one for a good price these days. So um, we have uh, um, a few questions. It looks like Tom also added um, some details about using, um, you know, um, circumnavigating copy protection uh, if you use a, a, a setup with a double VCRs. Mark uh, Boucher is asking um, our panelists, what did the piece of equipment called the shuttle do? What was its purpose? And I think that comes out of one of your uh, workflow documents. Yeah, so that's um, that's that's a piece of equipment called a Black Magic Intensity Shuttle, and it's basically an interface between uh, your VCR and your computer. So you plug in your output from your VCR, whether it's component, whether it's composite, whatever, into the Black Magic Intensity Shuttle, and then that connects to your computer via either um, a USB three or a Thunderbolt cable, and that's how you do the capture. Um, V record uh, in its current incarnation, um, uh, I think only interfaces with um, stuff from Black Magic for um, a few reasons that we can't get into right now. But um, uh, that that's what that piece of equipment is for. It's a it's a it's a uh, capture interface, and yeah, you can you can find them for about 200, 250 bucks or so. Great, good, good to know. Um, and um, uh, Beth uh, is actually mentioning um, this this phenomenon of sticky shed syndrome, um, uh, and points out that there are media digitization companies that specialize in, in the salvage of old films, um, and they actually even bake the v VHS tapes with uh, this type of syndrome and, and and can repair them. So maybe you know if we do encounter those uh, items in our collections that have uh, you know deteriorated, uh, we should um, set them aside at least and, and see if there, there is a third party vendor that can actually take care of that. Um, Doug adds that for straight, straightening tapes that have uh, crinkling or damaged sections, he will run them through, uh, he says he runs his conversions on a Hitachi FX6500 Hi-Fi, which cleans up the tapes um, in the rewinding process and he's built in cleaning heads for reading the magnetic tape. All right, Charles, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butt in here because we're getting Great. to the end of our hour. And thank you very much for uh, Q&A, Aaron. Thank you very much for, for hosting a little bit earlier. And thanks to all of our panelists, Tom Nemeth, Dave Rodriguez, and Phil Salvador for your work on this. A big, big special thanks to Third World Newsreel and Video Project for sponsoring today. Uh, their reels as well, the links to their reels as well as uh, this entire recording will be available on our site at videotrust.org probably within the next 24 hours, but definitely check back in a day or so. I'm going to email every registrant a link to the recording. Our April webinar is gonna be teaching with film. We look forward to seeing you all there and anybody else who's interested, tell all your friends, we'd love to have you participate. Uh, obviously we could have done more on this topic today. We'll probably bring it back up soon. Thanks again to everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, goodbye.